Welcome all. Since the 2020 Karabakh war, there have been real fears that Azerbaijan may launch yet another war in the South Caucasus. Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev has consistently stated that there are two choices facing the people of Nagorno-Karabakh. Either they accept Azerbaijani citizenship or they leave. He has also made it clear that under Azerbaijani rule, Nagorno-Karabakh will have no autonomy, no special status. Um, this lack of pressure by the world powers on Aliyev has made this quite possible, but this is a hypothetical situation, but an eventuality that could be very real for the region and the world. To discuss this, I'm joined by Civilnet host and analyst Eric Akopian. Eric, thanks again for your time. It's a pleasure. So Eric, we're talking here hypothetically about what would it mean the realization of Aliyev's dreams, Aliyev's maximalist uh, demands. Um, you know, we're talking here about the possible ethnic cleansing of Nagorno-Karabakh or Nagorno-Karabakh coming under Azerbaijani control. Um, first off, what would it mean for Armenia's government if Azerbaijan's maximalist demands were realized? Well, first we need to say, we need to be very clear. What you mean is ethnic cleansing. It's not because coming under control is the same thing as ethnic cleansing. There's, there's really no difference in that. So people need to understand that distinction. Uh, what this means for this government is it'll be the end of it. Uh, the issue will be when. Uh, does it fall immediately or most likely it will fall during the next elections? And to be replaced by, uh, most likely replaced by people who probably supported the revolution. Uh, who will be very anti-Russian, but far more militarist. Mm. And what would it mean for, you know, Armenia's democracy since the 2018 revolution? <clears throat> um, people have lauded Armenia's democratization, but there are worries that if, if Aliyev's demands are realized, that this could be the end for democracy in Armenia. I'm not, I don't know if it means an end for democracy in Armenia. I think it will, it, it will change. Uh, this will change everything. We have to understand this will be the beginning of the Third Republic. The, 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 the moment, the, the day that this happens, the Second Armenian Republic will have uh, ceased to exist and would have seen as a failure. This will be the, the beginning of the Third Armenian Republic. And it'll be uh, a very belligerent militaristic state. Uh, if you really want to sort of get a shortcut to what the future will hold, is I would, uh, there's this uh, famous Zionist writer, Ziv Jabotinsky, who had this theory of the Iron Wall. Mm. And the idea was that uh, our enemies will never accept us under any circumstances. You should have no illusions. It's all about military power mm -hmm. and the, the ability to make it so costly for them that they actually leave you alone and come to terms with you. Uh, you can go read his uh, speech and that will give you a sense of where this country is going to go to. Uh, I think what you're going to have, this will likely end. It won't end westernization. It will, it, you will have modernization without liberalism. Mm-hmm. Uh, in which, uh, think Israel in today's terms, uh, a country that is very much integrated into the world economically, but culturally uh, and uh, the basic motif of the state does not match that. Mm -hmm. And what would you do you think it would mean for Armenia's society and national consciousness, perhaps even for the Armenian global nation, for the Armenian diaspora communities around the world? Well, I mean, uh, most of the, the diaspora communities, uh, this will shatter many of them uh, in the sense that there's already a, a sort of a, an age type of uh, generational gap between uh, younger Armenians around the world, the ones who are active really don't see our institutions as working. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, if you have what is considered uh, another genocide, uh, it will be considered as such by the Armenian psyche. 108 years later, what credibility do any of these organizations have? So I think you're going you're gonna to shatter uh, these organizations or uh, reform them, or they will have, they will essentially carry uh, this, the universal Armenian mantle of uh, state building bent on uh, belligerent militarism mm -hmm. uh, around the world. Uh, <clears throat> in uh, Internally, uh, this will... Uh, it will, in many ways, actually cut out all foreign influence under in, in Armenian politics because Armenian politics will be defined by not caring what the world has to say. Uh, every institution, international institution, will be seen as a failure. All that matters is men and women with guns. Mm -hmm. uh, so you will have this. Uh, we already have, in actual real terms, the most militarized state in the world, except it's just not talked about. It'll just take this to another level. Mm. And, I mean, 
It's also interesting what this would mean for Armenia's various relationships with other world powers, um, notably what this would mean for Armenia and Russia's relationship. Obviously, Russia is supposed to be the security guarantor in the post-2020 war period, but um, Aliyev's maximalist demands being met for many would mean that there is not a need anymore for a Russian presence or a shift in how Russia uh, rea uh, interacts with Armenia and Azerbaijan. What do you think that would mean for the Russian side if you, we woke up one day to find Azerbaijani flags over Stepanakert? Uh, it'll be it'll be the end of uh, all the formal Russian-Armenian relationships on the defense, security, military front. You will have, uh, in the short run, a, a Russia that allows the Armenians of Artsakh to be uh, uh, subject of genocide or ethnic cleansing is, is a Russia that is absolutely no use to Armenia. Mm -hmm. It'll be the end of Russian presence in Armenia, period, in the short run. And you mean uh, not, not just in, in Nagorno-Karabakh, but absolutely, also, also absolutely. in Absolutely. I mean, the, 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 this is already, the Russians have managed to do something incredible, which is to take a country that had no natural, instinctive, anti-Russian feeling, and they've created it. Uh, when the, the Russian, the attitude towards Russia will be on, on the Baltic country level. Uh, so uh, it, they'll, you know, it's uh, all of that is over in the short run. Uh, in the long run, it's a different matter. I think 15, 20 years from now, countries change, times change, regimes change. At the end of the day, uh, Russia is always going to be a primary power in this region. Uh, but in, in the short run, uh, it will. Uh, uh, it will entirely sever Armenia from Russia uh, in its in any kind of a security network or systems, uh, which is something that the West wants. But I don't think they know and understand the other consequences of of what that could actually lead to. And I want to speak about the West. I mean, let's start with Europe. The European Union has lauded Armenia's reforms and democratization since the 2020 war. It has given billions of euros as part of this package. Um, the EU has made it clear, in a sense, that the sovereign territory of the Republic of Armenia is a red line for them. They sent an EU civilian mission to the Armenia's borders. But interestingly, the tone is not the same when it comes to Nagorno-Karabakh. But still, if... Aliyev's demands were met and the ethnic cleansing of Nagorno-Karabakh were carried out. What do you think that would mean for Brussels and for Armenia's approach towards Brussels? They will be uh, two steps below hated as much as Russia for a simple reason. is because they've essentially, in so many words, have said you give up uh, Artsakh or sovereign or any issue of uh, self-determination. But through working through international mechanisms, we will protect the uh, rights and securities of people in Azak. In fact, even Borrell mentioned that in a tweet yesterday. For the first time ever, he mentioned the rights and securities of people in Azak, which they have not done in two years. So this will be viewed as uh, you, you conned us, that you lied to us. You had no intention. That was uh, The EU will be tagged as a party that actually wanted ethnic cleansing. So in the short run, it might not manifest itself, but in the long run, uh, the entire European project outside of the economic development sphere will, a sphere will be viewed as in very hostile terms. Do you think they understand that? It's interesting that you say that they almost don't understand that, that if that became a reality, they would not probably enjoy that reality. No, they don't understand it. Hmm. They don't. Because uh, in their view, they see Artsakh as, you know, the region of Finland that went to the uh, Russians after the war, you know. So, you know, mm -hmm. you move people out of there and, you know, there's peace. They don't, they do not understand what, uh, that this will actually trigger. This will be viewed by the collective Armenian nation as a second Armenian genocide, but that the world knew about it, did nothing. Which means that the entire body politic will unite to reverse this humiliation over time. And that would mean essentially disregarding uh, what any world power demands, cares for, or has concerns about. Mm. You will have this phony, uh, you know, uh, approach in which you talk about peace and other things, but no one actually is gonna believe it. 
and everyone's going to act uh, to reverse that, no matter what the consequences. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that you, you, uh, the prime minister had said that the Europeans had encouraged the Armenian side to move from talking about the status and self-determination of Karabakh to the rights and securities of the people living there. But you have also spoken about the United States being a very important player in the past. And you've also mentioned that the United States is uniquely one of the, maybe even the only player that can viably pressure Azerbaijan and, you know, there is this almost sense of fear of the United States in Baku. But uh, many Armenians, we have to say, have complained about Washington's military aid to, to Baku. Um, I'm wondering, what do you think the reaction would be amongst DC politicians and civil servants if Aliyev's demands were met? And how would Armenians view the United States if that happened? Uh, their view would be they're, they're entirely fine with it. Uh, they'll 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 go out of their way to help deal with the consequences and look very compassionate, but they don't. They're not. They're not going to care, uh, and ultimately, they're they see that as some kind of a solution. Uh, however, I think it's going to. This is uh, uh, in the short run, actually, because the the push against Russia will be far more severe than against anybody else. Uh, this will become a very pro-American country on the short run. And the, the relationship with the United States will actually deepen in far more significant ways and open ways. Uh, because the United States is the only country that can actually stop things diplomatically. No one mm -hmm. else can really do that. So on the short run, you will have a country that is far more pro-American. But in the long run, that's sort of uh, once this country gets back on its feet and... Uh, continues this process of becoming more uh, affluent mm. and building structures that are far more solid. Over time, it will become belligerent uh, and uh, the U.S. influence here will wane over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've been mentioning it, but you're, it's almost like you're saying that there's this attitude in the West that the ethnic cleansing of Karabakh is the solution, is, mm -hmm. the, is the easy way out of this, this mess. Um, I just want to also mention that Azerbaijani officials, including the president, are making it very clear that should Az uh, Karabakh become part of Azerbaijan fully, it would have no special status, no autonomy, no democracy, no cultural rights. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about that? That even after all of this, after Armenia made so many concessions, land handovers, was defeated in a war, Azerbaijan is now making even more maximalist demands mm -hmm. out of Armenia. And f um, what do you think it would mean for Azerbaijan, for their regime, for their regime's continuity? Actually, from a very cynical point of view, uh, for this Artsakh issue to continue for another 20 years is actually quite favorable to them for, for, for mm -hmm. regime survival. Mm -hmm. In their view, if the solution is ethnic cleansing in Artsakh and you control, take control of Artsakh without any Armenians, that starts all issues in many ways become internal. Yes, they can continue this belligerence against Armenians, except it just becomes less credible over time. Uh, and there'll be more pushback. Uh, people don't want their kids to die over some village in some hilltop somewhere that does not, is not part of, I mean, they'll always be extreme nationalists, but it, the, the, the bandwidth for warfare with Armenians actually narrows politically. And even totalitarian states uh, are cognitive of public opinion to, some, to a certain extent. Uh, they, they're cognitive to a certain of uh, public opinion to the extent that it uh, means regime survival. And mm -hmm. if they see that that's no longer profitable, they stop going there. However, uh, okay, the day after, you know, you've taken over and you've taken the photos and all the rest of that, um, then all the issues become internal. Uh, why are we not free? Uh, why don't we have democracy? Why are we the poorest people in this region? Why are we getting poorer? Why don't we have economic growth like our neighbors do? Why can't we travel the world like our neighbors do? Even their formal borders are closed. Uh, so, it's uh, it actually starts t the, the clock starts ticking towards the end of the regime the moment mm -hmm. that happens. So actually, this issue continuing is more useful to the regime than okay. a, a final complete victory. However, it doesn't mean that he doesn't go for it. Uh, there's also a timeline issue 
Uh, the world's in crisis. Uh, uh, there's war in Europe. Uh, and the balance of forces between these two countries are going to change over time. So if you're going to have that ethnic cleansing, you want to do it now because it's going to become difficult, more difficult to do as time goes by. So there's a timeline issue. Uh, by 2030, they stop becoming an oil. Uh, they stop exporting oil in, in, in any real terms. And they're marginal, quite marginal players in the oil and, and the gas field and, and the gas sector. And everybody knows that. And it's becoming actually even more and more clear to the world that all these deals and things that were cut were a fraud. So I think that's what that's what it would mean uh, for the regime. As far as the second part of the question, which is the, the the Western perception that ethnic cleansing is some kind of a uncomfortable solution to this, they have no idea what they're talking about. Uh, this will unleash all the uh, you know all the forces of hell uh, in this region and in Armenia. Mm -hmm. uh, again, in the Armenian psyche, this will be viewed as a second Armenian genocide. Uh, and it'll be viewed as uh, for what it is, which is the last group of Armenians in the world, pretty much that have never been ethnically cleansed off their land, being ethnically cleansed off their land, uh, which essentially will mean after a short truce or armistice, uh, will mean two more generations of war. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, I was in uh, the genocide memorial the other day and, uh, and the thing that struck me this was built in 1965 or it, it, it was built 50 years after the first genocide and what that tells you is that armenians were not even allowed to mourn their genocide for 50 years after it happened uh this time there's an armenian state and there's a much faster more affluent armenian nation internationally uh, the response to this this will be responded to. This will not stand. Um, there will be preparation. There will be a complete militarization of the state, mm -hmm. the militarization of everything. Uh, and uh, everything will be driven by reversing this humiliation mm -hmm. in, in the harshest terms. Uh, and, that will, and, and it will be completely... It, this will be a politics that completely disregards anything anybody else has to say, any country, any international law or consequences. Uh, and you're going to have an Armenian politics in which every single time the leader, whoever the on the election, you know, systems, the most militarist, uh, the one who's most nationalist will win. So uh, I can guarantee you. Nikol Pashinyan is going to be the last Armenian prime minister that ever speaks of peace uh, in an honest way. Uh, he, he, will be, he will be the last one. Everything from this point on uh, is going to be uh, creating this uh, belligerent state that is capable and more than willing to kill 10 of yours for one of yours. Yeah. Yeah, it will be, it will be a state in which politics will be primarily driven by men and women in guns who have the uh, the junk, the the uh, the ability and uh, the desire to use them against foreign enemies. Okay. And Eric, very briefly, I want to get your reaction. Last week, Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev said that either you accept Azerbaijani citizenship to the Armenians of Karabakh he's speaking to, or you leave Karabakh completely. Another one of his officials said that Armenians may wake up one day in Stepanakert and find Azerbaijani flags flying over them. What do you think of that? It is what it is. He's, he's, he's saying he's for ethnic cleansing and he's asking the world, are you going to do anything about it? And so far the answer is no. There you go. Well, Eric, what can I say? Thanks for your time. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on Civil Net.